It says, please request recording permission. Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, episode three of the University of Chichester Department of Psychology in interview series. And I'm really happy to be um, joined tonight by my, by my friend and colleague, um, Brian Penny, who is soon to become Dr. Brian Penny. Um, and we're just going to discuss Brian's journey um, to where he is now, having done his undergraduate degree in psychology and his PhD in psychology and neuroscience at Trinity College in Dublin. And first of all, we're, we're going to discuss Brian's past. And he's, uh, he's going to be very frank and open and honest. Um, he's a fantastic speaker, a really deep thinker. And um, his thoughts on anxiety and mental health and trauma and how that is linked to his own past and his own behaviors. And uh, he's, he was uh, addicted to heroin for about 15 years. And so we're just going to listen to some of, of Brian's um, story. And you're very welcome, Brian. Cheers. Thanks for having me in. Really looking forward to this. <laughs> Um, Brian, can you just start up? Can you talk a little bit about your um, early childhood? Yeah, so my early childhood. So I, I always tell, like people ask me, uh, tell us a little bit about your story, and I say, yeah, my story started the minute I was uh, I came into the world. So I came into the world with a condition known as intestinal malrotation, and in layman's terms, that literally means that my intestines were twisted, and I wasn't really getting any nutrients into my body. So um, basically, a short story, my mom knew something was wrong. She went back to the hospital um, over the, the couple of weeks because I was getting some nutrients in, but not much. And she just knew something was wrong. The hospital kept on saying, oh, look, it's just colic. It's just colic. Treating her like a young mother. That's a bit silly young mother. And she just, I once said, she just says, no, there's something seriously wrong. And she went in and she says, look, you have to check my baby. There's something wrong. And she says, I was going limp in her arms. And they, they sort of were annoyed. And he says, right, we'll weigh it. We'll weigh him. And he put me on a scales and it was half my birth weight. And they actually freaked out. It was like, whoa, we've made a big mistake here. So I was uh, rushed over to Hark Har Court Street Hospital, police escort. Like it was that big a, big a deal. Like it was at this stage, it was nearly life or death. I was slipping away. And that isn't even the worst part. I was only given a 5% chance of living. I went into surgery, had surgery, lived, obviously. But the funny thing with that, when I wrote my book last year, I was doing a bit of research around this, or my book two years ago, sorry. Uh, I was doing, me, uh, doing research around that. And I found out that it was only in 1985 that the medical practice realized that infants experience pain like normal adults. And before 1985, if infants were going under the under the knife they were not given a general anesthetic it was based on weak uh, pinprick and evidence from 1940 so and um, what i've realized since uh, with my background in psychology and doing that like so i, I had complications from that surgery and um, for a year i cried for the first year of my life so from an organism perspective i was just like i just associated the whole world with pain i create these associations i was scared of everything my body was on fight or flight looking for danger and on on the alert at all times and I think that really primed me for a life of anxiety. And my childhood growing up, I remember just being a worrier. From, from the moment I could think and speak, I was just worrying about everything. My family dying, my mom and dad dying, every, all these weird little things. And there was a lot of alcohol in my family as well, alcohol problems. So my memories from six to 10 years of age, like I'm just really covering the, there was nice parts of my life, obviously, but I'm just really covering the traumas that really set the stage for me. I remember like from the age of six to 10, every Thursday, Friday, Saturday night and Sunday night, four nights a week at the weekend, just waiting at the window for my mom and dad um, to come home from the pub because I knew they'd be drink driving and I used to be terrified. And I never shared this with anybody, but I literally just sat in my window for hours every night waiting for the cars to come by. And I remember just, I'd be there, oh, this could be them, this could be them, this could be them. The hopes would build, the car would drive past, the hopes dashed and the anxiety just searing through my body. And that's one of the biggest memories I have in my life. And I, I think it really just shaped me on top of the earlier childhood trauma, just to be really agitated, restless, anxious. I didn't know that that was the warden at the time. And I was basically just consumed by my mind and tormented by anxiety. And that was really my childhood in a, in a nutshell. And would you have been seen as an anxious child by your friends, just say your friends at school, or were you seen as kind of a happy-go-lucky, typical Dublin child? 
Happy go lucky, typical Dublin child. So so my anxiety sort of I, I, had a, I had a great shield. Like I played football, I was good in school, and um, I'd done well at school, I was good in school. I would say there was times when I came across anxious 100 percent there definitely was, but my anxiety really lived with me when I was on my own. And when I, I was great at putting up this facade, I was great at putting up this shield. I'm grand, everything's okay, putting up this mask. And as I said, there was happy memories. When I was playing football, I was obsessed with football. There was happy memories within that, there was happy memories within the family as well. And I was popular enough as well, like I, I got on, but there was just always this unrelenting anxiety, always like it wasn't always like relentless, but it was unrelenting because it was always there. And sometimes it would it would go up and down, the levels of it would go up and down, but it was always there. And it just it just always lived with me. I, I think there was no language at the time. If I was this, I, I always described myself more as a warrior than someone yeah. that was anxious. My understanding of anxiety now that it's very physical and as I got deeper into addiction, I'm sure we'd be chatting about now, uh, anxiety became just a, a, like a, a voice around my chest and a, and a pressure in my head. But back then, I think it was more head kind of stuff and it was more worrying and I'm sure it manifested in the body as well. Yeah, so would you say that's different to intolerance of uncertainty, which a lot of people say anxiety is, we just kind of handle not knowing what's going to happen next. Or was it, you were saying it's anticipatory worry was your big thing, just continually anticipating that the future is going to be bad. That yeah, and your parents are going to crash coming home from, from, from the pub to drink driving you know, or the worst is going to happen. Yeah, it was like the worst. I think you've nailed it in, in the last, them last words there. It was always the worst is going to happen. Never really so much a fear about myself. Like I remember the car thing with my mom and dad was huge because I remember when my older brother started driving at about 18. Um, I was always worried about him coming home late and obviously he was in a band he was going out to like four in the morning and then that became something as well so I was just always worried about family members dying and that the worst was going to happen and um, yeah that, that, that day would be the big memories yeah so um, so you, you're you're fine at school I said you're you're popular and you, you're you're good at, good at football so there wasn't anything obvious that would say direct you down to a path that of say drug addiction apart from the anxiety itself so could you explain how you first came into contact with with drugs yeah so in, in saying that and it's funny uh senator lynn ruan i had her on the radio show there not so long ago and, and lynn ruan came from a loving family as well um, I don't think there was addiction in her family, but she said living in the area that she lived in, there was always this underlying stress as well. Like, like other memories I had was my dad being a vigilante, going out fighting all the young lads in the estate. There was wars in the estate. So yeah. I came from a very, a very community-based area, but very disadvantaged. Yeah. Robbed cars every single night, up and down the road. Um, lots of violence. As I said, my dad was a vigilante and all that kind of stuff, like fighting these people back years ago. So there was always that source of danger and and with areas like this there was people that were that had been through their own traumas that were very rough very rugged and there was just craziness in the estate so and drugs were rife drugs were everywhere so I was as I mentioned I was a very good footballer and I started saying I might have a career in football but I got an injury when I was 14 and I wasn't playing for a couple of months and I remember ironically on the football dressing rooms of all places all palling with my friends my friends were all smoking cigarettes at this time and starting to smoke a bit of hash as well. And um, I was like, no way would I smoke a cigarette. That's bad for me, my football career. But I remember my friend Alan one time saying, oh, it's a great head buzz you get off this. And maybe, I can't remember, maybe it was the time I was getting curious about drugs. That's when you yeah. start drinking in their area anyway. And I said, get a head buzz off that. I said, give it a little, I'll try that head buzz thing. I'm not going to smoke, but I'll try that. And I remember there was a big roll up, Samson tobacco roll up, a big fat one. And I remember taking a puff of it and I loved that little head buzz. I loved it. I remember just, oh, I felt sick, but I said, that head buzz is really, really nice. And then after that, within a couple of weeks, couple of months, I was smoking. I was smoking hash. We start uh, drinking. We start messing around with blowing petrol in the fields. And it really escalated very, very, very quickly. And we were doing tablets and ecstasy and acid over the next couple of years. It just escalated very, very quickly. Yeah, they say, I was at teachers in school who always said that the dangerous year was between 14 and uh, and 15. That's when you can really lose young boys mm -hmm. and girls. Like that was, right. like you said, no, it, it, it escalated really, really quickly there for you. So, um, and where, where, where to go next? You said that you're taking tablets and ecstasy and um, hash and so on. So how did it develop to more hard uh, class A type drugs? Hard drugs. We, we blame Jim Morrison. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So we, we used to have him, be, uh, my best mate, he was still on the streets with heroin addiction. He never he never got out of it. I only seen him recently over Christmas. 
it's um it's really sad. But um we used to have these nights in his house. We'd call him we had some name from just Jim Morrison nights. We'd all be in his kitchen, lights off, candles going, Jim Morrison playing, smoking loads and loads of hash. And we got into the Jim Morrison music, his poetry, his books, all that kind of stuff. And Jim Morrison said something, you have to try everything once. And we lived on Jim's word. We says, right, we have to try heroin. We have to do this. We have to do that. And when uh, when I, I tried methadone, funnily enough, at 16, when I was, and, and before I'd done heroin, I, don't, I, I didn't think it was an opiate, but apparently my friend has since said, no, we did, no. We just had to ignore that fact. Mm. But we says, right, we're going to do heroin once. And we went out to my friend's house. There was five of us that night. We went out to my friend's house and he'd done it before. He was like uh, my friend's cousin. He'd done it before. A couple, uh, He was about a couple of years older than us. And we went over, he had three bags of heroin. And I talk about this in the book. I call the chapter Falling in Love, my first night doing heroin. And I'll never forget that first night. And I'm not, I'm not glamorizing it. It will, it took me to heaven that night, but it will take you to hell. That's a fact. But I remember the first time I was, I was, I was addicted nearly to the ritual before it even got heroin into me. I just loved everything about it for some reason. I don't know why. I was like, I was like a sponge. I was like an academic, like remembering all the different details of how you smoke heroin. And I remember just the first few lines I took, it was just like floating in an ocean of bliss. And the more lines I took, the deeper I fell. And I remember I described it in the book. It was like a soft, warm blanket that just wrapped around my soul. My muscles went quiet. My mind went quiet. Then bodily sensations went quiet. And I just fell into this abyss. And it was just, there was even a voice to it as well. It was just like, this, this is just beautiful. Keep me close. I remember I describe it in the, in the book like that as well. So keep me close. I'll protect you. And I was like, right, I, 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 I need to have this in my life. This is the thing I've been looking for all my life. It was like protecting me from the demons that had always um look always been chasing me. And an interesting point of this as well was like I was never given an anesthetic as an infant. I struggled with anxiety up until I was 17 years of age. I, I struggled with it until I was 35 years of age, to be honest. Um, but I found me anesthetic at 17 years of age in the shape of heroin. And this is, was like, this is what I was missing my entire life. That's what I felt at that time. Now, I thought I was too clever to be an addict. I, I was going places. I was still into football. I felt myself. I'm good at school. I had a big career ahead of me in, me, in my own head, full of self-belief. So I wasn't going to be, I, I'm not like them. I'm not like them kind of addicts. So I started to mess around with heroin once a week, twice a week for the next few years. But then I had a massive panic attack, my first panic attack at the age of 20. And I remember that was just a game changer for me. I was, I was getting deeper into heroin addiction. I was doing it three, four times a week. I was nearly physically addicted. But I rationalized and justified to myself. I can't because my panic attack started to elevate my anxiety. My baseline anxiety stayed a lot higher after that first panic attack. And I just couldn't work. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't operate. And I justified to myself, right, I have to do heroin. It's the, the world is telling me I have to do heroin. And then I spent the next 15 years chronically addicted to heroin. That's amazing, Brian. Thanks for being so open with him. So when you talk about that voice, and I think in the book, you just said it's actually, it was a female voice and said, keep yeah. me close. So that's, so that's the effect that the drug has. It's almost like it's telling you that you need this. This is, this is going to protect you. And just an interesting point there is you're saying it's not an absence of negativity. It's just an absence of anything, an absence of any feeling at all. So it's not just that you're getting rid of bad, anxiety or depression or whatever that you're experiencing that's causing psychological suffering and stress you just actually it's not even adding anything that positive in a sense it's just actually getting rid of any feeling whatsoever yeah 100 percent. and i've said i've said this before like they say heroin is getting high and i don't think heroin is getting high it's 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 um the absence of feelings i think that's the best thing but there is a beautiful euphoric vibe to it as well. So I don't know if euphoria, I wouldn't describe euphoria as a feeling. There is a, there's a pleasure. There is a pleasure within it as well. So it's the absence of any negative feelings, 100%. But there's no, it's, there's no ecstasy. There's no like, um, it's not like cocaine. It's not like other drugs or alcohol where you're buzzing or anything like that. But there is a beautiful euphoria underneath the absence of feelings. And I would say it's subtle. But it's powerfully subtle. If that's if that if I am explaining that the right way, and I think the, the essence, or the, I think heroin is really captured in the song by Pink Floyd, "Comfortably Numb." Yeah. Comfortably numb, and that's what you are. So comfortable, so numb. Nothing. You're impenetrable. It's like a shield that you have for any negative emotions, any negative thinking. Everything goes quiet. It's like a shield. And um, yeah, but that, but that, but that beautiful little euphoria is always underlying un, un, underneath. But the funny thing is. 
you're not chasing the euphoria. It's not like I want more cocaine. I messed around with crack for a while as well. I want more crack. You're, you're, once you get it into you, you're happy in your little sea of bliss. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a unique drug. And you're saying, even now, you're, so you're still open, even though your life is very, very different now, you still say that was still probably the most beautiful night of your life, the first time that, that you had took heroin in terms of it took you to a place that you never thought was possible. Yeah, so it's it's funny because since the documentary came out, um, I've met someone last year. Now, with the, when the documentary came out, I, I had met them, and um, but I hadn't talked about this this kind of a thing. So, like, I, I talk about heroin as being a relationship. It was like a marriage. I lost, I, 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 the marriage was broken up when I, when, I, when I got clean, and it was, it was crazy. Um, but I've since met someone um, last year, and we're crazy about each other. And I remember I, I was I was in relationships. I wouldn't even call them relationships. I had encounters, let's say, when I was younger and stuff like that. But once I got into the depths of heroin, it's just what well, I wasn't interested in relationships or anything like that. But I've met her name is Natalie, beautiful girl, and we're, we just got on fantastically well. But I remember um, it was at the very start of COVID when we first started chatting with each other, and we ended up having these like video calls like eight we hadn't met each other yet and we hadn't like these eight yeah. hour we had an eight hour video call i'm like what is going wow, on I don't, I, they, I'm, I'm like i'm like nine o'clock up at half nine or up at, up, at, yeah. up at five in the morning sometimes half four go to bed at nine o'clock and all of a sudden my whole routine went out the window and uh, we are up eight hour video calls it was crazy and i knew something really different was happening to me and i remember this is crazy without even before we'd even met each other and now we, we talked about everything that could be talked about through video calls zoom calls and different stuff like that and i remember lying in my bed one night and I, I, there was something happening i remember just feeling so happy after meeting natalie and chatting and we knew something was happening she knew what was going on she knew what she actually said yeah you're falling in love with me she actually said at the time and i said oh, i've never been in love that doesn't happen to me <laughs> but I, I remember lying in my bed one night and sort of felt this pulling sensation in my heart. Now, I used to hear about people talking about love being physical and all these kinds of things, but I didn't really believe it. But I remember just having this beautiful, like, pulling sensation from my chest and just this amazing experience. And that, for me, has bettered the experience with heroin by a million miles and the relationship I've developed with her. And, 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 and that feeling I have in my heart for me, nephews and stuff like that, and my family as well. But there's a great line, it's Johan Harry's line, that, uh, sobriety sobriety is not the opposite of addiction connection is and i've come yeah. to realize that i just had no connection in my life i didn't allow anyone to get near me i had to shield up all the time so i was always craving connection and i looked for it artificially in heroin and i was up to that point the best moment of my life but i've had much more fuller beautiful natural moments since then so i wouldn't describe it as the best moment at that time and, and it's something you might interest you in as well it wasn't the best because heroin is the best it was the best by comparison because I was so tormented. It made it. It's like it's like if you're going to watch a film and someone says, "Oh, it's supposed to be a brilliant film." It might be a great film, but it's a bit of a letdown. So it's the comparison of if you if you're not expecting a good film, you're like, "That was absolutely brilliant." So it was the comparison of the taking the pain away on top of the joy. It was so reinforcing for me because there was a couple of friends with me that night that done heroin. They weren't brought into that world because it wasn't as reinforcing. So it was beautiful for me because it helped me to escape the pain I was in and that's what made us so beautiful yeah, yeah it's, it must be powerful because you describe it very explicitly in the book as well in terms of the following morning saying that you've never actually got physically sick like it and yeah. it, it is and it is it's very gruesome the way you describe it so we would normally say if you've been drinking alcohol and you've got a specific uh, alcoholic drink that you have late at night that you don't normally drink and you feel really rough the next day and you're getting sick that you you condition yourself you get classic condition saying that's i'm not going to drink that again and most of us have that response yeah not to alcohol itself but to that specific drink and yet heroin must have been so powerful for you to overcome that you said it was the worst sickness you've ever had was the following morning after the first night yeah the, the worst vomiting experience i ever had and i was sort of afraid of vomiting before that but i remember like the, i describe it like the chunks and pushing it down the plug yeah. hole and all and but it was actually just a beautiful experience because the euphoria of heroin was still just coursing through my body. And I remember they started to give me another buzz, it gave me another another lift or something like that. It was a crazy experience. That yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy. Yeah. yeah. Can you just describe how your relationship with was your family? And you you described like there were some very tough moments. For example, when um, your 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 household was paid a visit and and there was a fire. Could you describe? Some of that, please. Yeah, so that was um that was getting into the into the deeper times. Well, I shared the pictures in. I'm just at the thinking. I meant to share them earlier on. I'll just share them. Get to, I think a You're picture. Very happy with that, Brian. Yeah, yeah. A, pi a picture paints a thousand words, as they say. So, 
this is just for me core. So, um, yeah, that's just from a course. I do benefits of a morning routine. You can ignore that. Um, so basically, that's a picture of me um, on the left two years before I hit rock bottom after 15 years of chronic heroin addiction. The picture of me there is the, is the thing for me booked there last year. But in the, in the intervening time of me um, at 20 years of age, having my first panic attack and going into the world of, of like diving deep into the world of heroin. And by the time that picture happened, like I brought me, they say like the, I love this saying, like addiction's not a spectator sport. Eventually the whole family get to play. And boy God, yeah. did, I get, did I bring them on that journey with me. Like there was times like uh, as in the documentary that you're seeing in like, um, what you call it, my, the, my my car and my mom's car were pushed against the house, set alight, front of the house all burned. And we were all, me, my mom, my brother, my sister, um, woken up that night. We, we had to run down the stairs with the flames sort of all co- coming under the door. It was, it was a scary experience. And it turned out it was my fault for me drug dealing and for me messing around. Like, I, I, like, I, I did, I'm not going to say I didn't sell drugs. I sold drugs. It was, I didn't try to make money. It was all, and I'm not trying to justify that, but it was always to feed the addiction. But I think it's important yeah. to get that across. There's, there's, yeah, it's it's a funny one. I've got to be open with that as well. Like I, I sold drugs to, to feed me habit, and that's just that's just what it was. And I think it was part of that that brought them troubles to the door. But that was still before I got really, really bad. I think that was me late twenties. So I was nine years into heroin addiction at that stage, and I was fairly functional up until that point. I always got money. I stayed. I still had my job. I I had a nice car. I went on holidays, mental holidays. We won't go. On. Yeah. They were crazy. They were crazy holidays. We're normal holidays by any stretch of the imagination. But um, I was fairly functional until that time. But over the next five years, me 30 to 35, there were the latter five years of my addiction. And especially the last two and three years, it was like a curve just went, woof, I, I, it escalated. And I got to the stage where you can see the picture on the left there. Like I, yeah. I, I just got, I, I wasn't even that overweight. I was just bloated from taking methadone and benzos and drinking alcohol, anything any combination of drugs to numb the pain. It was literally all about numbing the pain, numbing anxiety. But what I didn't know was it was like a snake trying to eat its own tail. The drugs were causing the anxiety. I was taking more drugs. Tolerance levels were going up. I, I, I teach the neuroscience of addiction now at Trinity College. So I know exactly what I was doing to myself from a neuro yeah. perspective. I was destroying myself and, and causing anxiety. And it got to the stage where I couldn't drive. Uh, I could barely drive. I could barely function. I lost everything in my life. But I remember just asking my sister to give me a lift. And I'd bring, she wouldn't know, but I'd be bringing her on drug deals. I asked my mom one time for a lift. She refused. And I says, look, I'm not even going to get me methadone. Can you just bring me over to the, to, the, to the chemist? But I wasn't even going to the chemist. I was meeting another guy around the corner to sell drugs or buy drugs. I can't even remember. I think it was to buy drugs that time. And I remember getting back into the car and my mom was just in, t- in a flood of tears. But all I cared about was the heroin in my pocket. I just cared about my own pain. And I know you're you're into RFT and you're into all that as well. Like, But that's why I was very, I will, we'll get into that maybe in a second of why RFT and, and self-talk has become so important to me. Yeah. But at that moment, it was all about me. I needed drugs for Brian to numb the pain so I can feel better. And I I, I became disconnected from everybody because I couldn't feel their pain. If I was empathic to anybody, I would have hurt them too much. So I created this mind-body disconnect. And I just lived in that world and numbed myself. Like I was literally a numbing machine. That's all I done. I anesthetized myself. I numbed myself. And I brought everyone on that journey with me. Ah, that's, that's, that's really powerful, Brian. That's really emotion. So, um, so you um, it was very powerful as well when when your sister does described in, in the documentary as well. Like, um, it's amazing the connection that you have now. But she did she did say, and she was very honest, said that at that point in in your whole family's life, like, she said that if you had died, and it looked like there was potential that you could have died at any point when you reached that very low or mm-hmm. rock bottom, that it might have been easier in on on the family in in a way because of the amount of stress that they had been through trying to live, um, to help you through and. and all, all the things that happen around uh, drugs and said addiction and the buying and so on but just seeing you going through that e- each time but yet um how, how do you feel when say when, when your family say that to you now just and i see that the, the absolute love that they have for you and how open they are yeah it's it's crazy to hear that and and um I, i've had a chat about my sister since the documentary came out and we are chatting about this very thing and she sort of thinks that i don't fully feel 
the impact that that should actually have. Now, I, I sort of, I, I think I'm more logical minded, but I think it's part of the numbing process as well. Like, um, so I'm basically like, it makes complete sense for me because I was causing havoc. I wasn't going anywhere in my life. I was killing myself slowly, but while I was killing myself slowly, um, I was destroying my family. Like they, there's so much love in my family. So it was just scaring them so badly. Like I kept on trying to prove myself to be okay. So I'd show up in my mom's, like I'd get I said, go down to my mom's to, to just for to chat. And, and my brothers and I'd be saying, don't go down, don't go down. So I'm grand, I'll be grand. Because they were telling me, like I was banned from my mom's house, but I didn't even know, like to, for her to protect her own mental health. So I get down to my mom's. Sometimes she'd see me out in the car slumped over the wheel. Didn't even make it into the house. Other times I'd walk into the house and I'd literally fall asleep on the table within a few seconds. And I was, this is what I was doing all the time. And I was getting thrown out of the house just, but they, they would always take me back because there was so much love in the family. So it got to the stage where there was nothing they could do. So it makes perfect sense for them to say, yeah, it was, it, I it would be better if he was dead because it logically was so much better. And they didn't know I was going to have this experience and sort of this um, transformation, if, if you want to call it that. But um, it, it, I, to be honest, I don't think I fully delved into the fact and sat with them feelings and really sat with that and said, wow, my family thought it was better if I died. And I don't think I've really gone there. And I don't know if I really do need to go there because there's, there's that, that's, a, that's another thing as well. Probably yeah. a bit, a bit a sort of a chat that out in therapy sometime. Like um, I don't do therapy, but that, that could be something that's, um, there's, there's, there's work still to be done around the family, the family um, perspectives, you know, the family yeah. relationships. Yeah. It's powerful. So, um, at, at what point did you need? Did you feel that you needed to change? Like, was there an official rock bottom point? Yeah. So, um, when I was thirty five, I remember I, I'd lost like I lost every important relationship in my life. I lost my health. I lost my mind. I was going into a form of psychosis. I was thinking crazy things. I lost lost everything. No way of making money. And I remember saying, right, I need to get clean. I need I need to I need to look at this another way. I need to do something else, or I'm going to kill myself. And I remember um, trying to get into a detox facility, but they actually told me because I had benzodiazepine volume in my system, they told me, right, you can't get into the detox facility to get off methadone because you need to go in there benzo free because you're at risk of having seizures. There was another place I could have gone, but I would have had to wait eight weeks. So I remember just saying, right, I'm going to do a detox at home on my own. I was advised not to do that. So it was just a benzo detox at home on my own. I was still going to yeah. take methadone and uh, I was advised not to do it. But I says, no, I'm going to do it. And I ended up two days into that um, home detox. I had a grand mal convulsive seizure. And what actually happened within that seizure was that I I, uh, I drove my teeth through my tongue in the convulsions and split down the center of my tongue, blood everywhere. Mm. My brother thought I was dead. Put me more, like right till the end, I put my family through torture. My brother was crying. You've seen him in the documentary. He was really yeah. just traumatized by that event. He thought I was dead on the floor ambulance came up and my sister came to the house she was called to the house and my mom says I think Brian's dead something serious had to happen so she came to the house the ambulance expecting to see me in a, in a body bag she was expecting a zip bag that's the, the silly things going through her head well not really silly but she walked in and the only thing she remembers is I can't believe I was sitting on the thing saying I was just looking at her Elva and then um, she says I can't believe that cockroach is still alive they were the words she used <laughs> it, was, it was actually a bit more colourful yeah. than that it was more colourful <laughs> than that we won't go there yeah. but um, I got rushed I got taken to the hospital that night and the biggest this is this is the most important night in my life like also the most painful but also the most important and I remember sitting on the um, I remember sitting on the trolley in the hospital, I woke up that evening and sitting on a trolley and I was broken, beyond broken. I really was. And I remember I started pulling myself up off the trolley. I was trying to just jump out of my own skin. Like I was just, oh, I was feeling so horrific inside. I just wanted to escape myself. And I remember just dangling my legs off the side of the trolley and my mind just got fixated on this red fire extinguisher on the wall. And I couldn't make sense, but I was like, that's the color red. And that's it. And I could, I couldn't make sense. My variable world didn't work anymore. And I remember looking around the room and trying to name things and I couldn't make sense of anything. And I remember just thinking, Oh my God, yeah, that's brilliant. You're brain damaged. You have to do it now. Game over, pal. That is brain damage. And I remember just saying to myself, waiting, oh, oh, here's the anxiety. Here's the panic overwhelm. I was waiting for that surge to come over me. But I remember just lying down on the trolley saying, I am done. You win. I am done. I can't do this anymore. I'm done. I'm gone. I surrender. I don't think I used that language. I hadn't got that language at the time, but I was done. I gave up the fight. And I remember this sort of sense of calm came over me. Now, 
I did another four weeks of benzo detox. I did another couple of seizures. I did another couple of hospital visits. And then I got into the detox facility and I started coming off methadone and there. But when I was weaning off the methadone and all the drugs were coming out of my body, I stayed in the detox facility. There was a psychologist that advised me to read a book and do mindfulness. Crazy journey with mindfulness because I, I was afraid of my heartbeat, my pulse and my breath. Yeah. So they were telling me to focus on my breath. I said, <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid of my breath. I can't focus on my breath. I'm afraid. Of it. But I'd done it through nostril exercises and it was just a slow process. And I remember then reading the books, different spiritual books about Eastern philosophy. And it was like I transformed my desires of drugs onto education and curiosity of learning. And there was something, there was like an energy building in my body. I was, even though I was in the depths of detox, I was having these micro moments. It was like mania. It was like a form of mania. Like I'd be up yeah. in me, up in me uh, bed, right, scribbling in a diary. But there were some of the most profound and amazing moments in my life, whether it was mania, related to mania, I don't know. I really, but it was crazy spiritual experiences, you could call them. I don't know. But um, on October 8th, 2013, which was my fourth day clean ever, um, I remember just walking. The, the detox facility was on a farm. And I remember just got up that morning earlier than everyone else. And it was like the world was beckoning me outside. It was like there was something different about the day. Wonderfully different, but I didn't know what it was. And I remember just walking out and it was like the whole world was alive. Now, it wasn't sudden because I'd felt these sort of kind of shifts in the week or two previous to that. But that morning, it was just full on. And it was a beautiful October, clear sky, dew-soaked morning. And I remember the, the, the grass, the droplets on the grass, they were like diamonds. It was like nature it was breathing on me. This big, wet, dewy, meaty fence. I sat on that fence. The cat, Molly, who I had, who had messed around and played with on the farm. I, I created a very close bond with Molly yes. and, and the chickens. And we won't go, we won't go into that. Yes. But she crawled up my leg. And I just remember being intensely in the moment. And I felt amazing. And after that time, I started doing a bit more meditation. I went to a treatment facility and I remember doing a guided meditation. And at one stage, he says, thoughts will come in and thoughts will go out. And I remember just waiting for the thoughts and having this realization, wow, my mind is so still, which ironically is a thought. But yeah. I had this realization, my mind is so quiet. And then I was like, wow, my mind used to be so busy. And this really grabbed a hold of me. This really grabbed me big time. And I was like, what is this? What, why did I suffer? What was this compulsive thinking? And then I was reading about it in these spiritual books. Why do I not suffer anymore? What is the relationship between anxiety and this thinking? Because anxiety dissipated. It didn't disappear, yeah. but it really dissipated. It was going away. And I said, is there a relationship between worry and anxiety? I knew nothing about psychology at the time. Yeah. So that just set me on a journey of wanting to do a degree in psychology. As soon as I went to treatment, uh, as soon as I got out of treatment, I signed up for the following year. And I was obsessed about this relationship between the, the, the stories we tell ourselves, self-talk, the language we use, its relationship with emotions and how this is related to Eastern philosophy. And I just saw everybody out, Brian Roach. I talked to Brian Roach at Minute University, yeah. Yvonne Barnes Holmes, who was an amazing yeah. men mentor of mine. I would do courses with Yvonne. And a relational frame theory was giving me the answers to this transformation of stimulus function. The functions of stimuli and language travel through us. So language is a vehicle for emotion. That's what I realized. And that, that just sort of brought me on that journey. I, be, I, I became obsessed. You could say obsessed with academia. I got a scholarship for Trinity College. I'm in the final year of my PhD. And it just brought me on that on that journey of, of just, uh, yeah, it's crazy. And I, I, I just... I, I, I never I never completely lost that gift I was given in detox that day. This energy came into my body and I, I've carried that with it's dissipated to an extent, but I've carried that with me ever since. And I just had this love, this zest for life, this enthusiasm and passion for life that I just love and I tried to put it into every area of my life. And it's just it, I believe it, it was a gift I was given. Dumb luck, awakening, perspective shift. I don't know what it was. It was a gift and I, I I'm thankful for it every day. I can definitely vouch for that, Brian, because I remember when meeting you in Montreal at a conference, um, there that people were just getting uh, out of bed and going to the to the breakfast at the conference, and you just came in after being for your five mile run up to the top of the mountain on Mount, Mount Royal. Mount so, Royal, yeah, like, like yeah. You're saying what what what, um, what what a morning, just just too much to do. Like your <laughs> the energy you come across with that energy uh, all, all all the time, like your holy day. So, and that's not. Okay, and like you don't, I don't get a sense from you that that's trying to. It's not another form of distraction. It's not like the heroin was was trying to distract you from the anxiety. And this 
all this energy that you have now and the amount that you fit in every day. And the fact that you mentioned getting up at 4.30 or 5 a.m. in the morning because you've got so much that you want to pack in to any day. But I don't get the sense from you that you're you're using all that energy to push away. It's not another distraction technique away from the mindfulness. Like it's you're, you are actually just living, you're really enjoying life and uh, you're really passionate about so many things. So um, yeah. when you talked about the transformation of stimulus functions, so are you, are you talking about how anxiety trans transfers across from, it transfers or transforms ordinary everyday events into worrisome events just through everyday language? Yeah, and I, I suppose the way the way I'd be thinking about this, like I, I love the fear conditioning um experiments with transformation of stimulus function, and um like if you if I I just some great the, the experiments I love, it's like the the nonsense syllables like vuk keg, all of these kinds of words, and if you if you associate if you uh, associate a word with an electric shock, and then through language you say kog is bigger, so you associate uh, an electric shock with the word vex, so vex shock, yeah. vex shock. And then you associate the word kug. Kug is bigger than vec. Buck is bigger than kug. So just through language, you say that's bigger, that's bigger, that's bigger. And then when you show, present that final stimuli that's bigger, you get, there's a bigger galvanic skin response to that actual word. And that sort of them, some of them studies just blew me away that the functions, the fear function could just travel through the language. Like, so it, it, like in more lay terms, if you got mugged in a laneway and you'd say a church is like a laneway, but a dark, a dark uh, mausoleum or something is even worse than that. It's even scarier than that. So you mightn't have ever heard of a mausoleum. I, I'm not even too sure if I know what a mausoleum is. I have no idea. But um, yeah. like you will be more scared of that. Or, or if you didn't know what a spider was in French, and then all of a sudden you were t- you're not afraid of the French word because you don't know what the language is. Then you hear that's the same as a spider. You're going to be afraid if someone walked up behind you and says that word. And you're, if you're in France, you're going to get a fright if you're afraid of spiders. So like these functions can actually travel through language and this this bamboozled me i was like wow so like it's estimated i don't know how true this is but we've estimated sixty thousand thoughts a day and if they're primarily negative no wonder it's like stress response stress response stress response trigger 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 and it's just i i I feel i felt that's how i was living i was up in my mind this is gonna happen that's gonna happen my mom's gonna do that they're going out the weekend oh my god so in my mind i was thinking about projecting into the future all of these thoughts and I was literally just triggering myself through language nothing more than language through the thoughts that are there as well and it, it's really big for me like I'm very careful about my language to, to, the, to the extent I don't use the word just because I think it diminishes anything you say I avoid the yeah. word but I can't I must I avoid all them words I reframe my language as much as I can um, and it really comes back to the stories that we tell ourselves as well. Like the story I told myself in addiction was, I cannot cope. I need heroin to survive. I, I can't cope. I can't cope with anxiety. So I acted towards that. My story today is the exact opposite. My story today is adver- I, I, adversity doesn't stop me. I use it as fuel for growth. So any challenging situations that come into my sphere, I've had a few this year with COVID, I say, right, how can I learn from this? So I'm approaching challenges rather than running away from them and trying to numb them. So I think that's where the language is really, really important. But to answer your question more simply, it's more the functions of a, of a word or a stimulus traveling through the language is really, and that's in very lay terms, it's not really experimental, but in a more digestible lay way, that's the way I think about it. So that's quite, that's really well put actually. So you can you can describe your on your undergraduate journey. You already mentioned Brian Roach and Avon Barnes Holmes as being particularly uh, influential mentors. Yeah. So you ended up being top of your year. You you graduated with your um, BSc in, in or BA in psychology as, as top of the class. That that's quite an achievement, especially when you had spent the previous fifteen years. In a heroin. Yeah, it's funny. And like you could say I switched addictions, but I don't think it was that because it was more about approach rather than avoid. I wasn't avoiding yeah. feelings. Like I meditate, I start my days today, like for the last good few years now, with a morning routine with meditation, gratitude, visualization. I'm very in touch with my bodies. I do a lot of micro meditations. I'm always looking inward. Self observation is my biggest tool in me in, in my toolbox. I'm always looking inward and feeling my emotions. But um, at that time, I probably wasn't doing it as much. And I did become a little bit obsessed, already obsessed with, with college work and stuff like that. But it served its purpose at the time as well. Yeah. So I just loved it. I really had such a passion for it. 
And um, yeah, I, I came top of my class in the final year, second year in the final year, and best thesis as well, which was pretty cool. And that got me, I applied with um, for Rob Whelan. I applied with Rob Whelan. I met Rob in that time and I says, Rob, I'd love to work with you. And Rob says, let's do a yeah. master's together. So I applied for a, an IRC scholarship and got a scholarship to do my master's, a one-year master's. And then I got another scholarship to do my PhD, which I'm in the final year of Brilliant. now. But um, I think what you're touching on there is something we, we talked about before, Ian, as well. So in my undergrad, uh, for my thesis, which I got published, so I'd say there could be um, people from uh, ACBS li- listening to this. Mm-hmm. So it's published in ACBS. It was an IRAP study. So I was fascinated by the relationship of between addiction and wanting more. And basically, um, I when I got clean, I wanted more to read more books. I wanted to play more golf. I wanted meetings. I, I started fellowship AA at the time. I went to three meetings a day. Anything that made me feel good, give me loads of it. And then I rem- remember reading in an Eckhart Tolle book, Stillness Speaks, he had a whole page on what's wanting more. And I says, wow, that's really interesting. And I remember reading it again. I says, wow, that's my thesis captured in, in, in yeah. that kind of page. And when I was uh, when I was listening to other former addicts in recovery, I heard that if it feels good, I want more. And I remember thinking, right, what is this relationship between wanting more and addiction? Now, I couldn't get, from my undergrad, I couldn't get people in addiction because it wasn't, I couldn't get clinical, it would have been too hard. So I decided to do a mood induction. So I induced uh, p- uh, participants who are just college students into a neutral, positive and negative mood, induction mood. There's a really powerful effect we yeah. got from that. And what we found was that people that, I'd done an IRAP, uh, an implicit relational as- assessment procedure. So I was looking at implicit attitudes, really. Yeah. Um, ver- verbally, and yeah. we are looking at we were looking at um, whether people would w- w- want more. So this it's I won't go into the details of the Europe. It's complicated enough, but it's yeah. w- whether people would see wanting more as a good thing, and whether there's a relationship if people were negatively induced, would they want more? So like this wanting more was like a, an overall construct. I didn't say wanting more of something specific. It was just this generally more is good. So what we found was that people that were negatively induced they wanted more. And how I described that in the paper was it's like. Like if you if you feel stressed or anxious, you might emotionally eat, overeat. You might have a drink. You might retail therapy. All of these things in addiction are associated with uh, avoidance. And what do you do? You do something else. And if it feels good, you want more because it's more reinforcing. So I've been fascinated by this construct. And we put in a material measure, materialism measurement in there. It's the MV at the material value scale. And uh, yeah. we found uh, correlations with that as well. So a lot of my PhD research is looking at this as well. So we have a big, huge sample and we're at the find an extraordinary, really big correlations. We're going to look at a mo- modeling of this, looking at the relationship between wanting more, materialism, craving, alcohol use. El- mindfulness is a key player in here. It seems to be that people that lack mindfulness and are high in levels of impulsivity are really, uh, it's really predictive of alcohol misuse as well. So there's lots of really interesting uh, models in there. That's really interesting. So um, how would you define mindfulness? Because I've seen maybe 25 different definitions out there. And I'm also, I'm also curious as to the Eastern definition of mindfulness, because you're talking about um, when, you, when you're going through your, your rehab, that you really came in touch with those books, Eastern philosophy. So there's always seems to be a bit of a disconnect we see between Eastern philosophy, which is mindfulness is all about not being attached to anything, letting go yeah. of absolutely everything as well, just being in the moment. Whereas in the Western world, it's almost like do a little bit of um, just letting thoughts come and go, let them float on a leaf down down a river and and so on. And But then as long as it's leading you towards achieving goal, uh, goal striving. So it's never really quite mindfulness in the way we might talk about it in Japan or, or South Korea or Cambodia or so on. So we're because in the Western world, we always have, with capitalism, we have to be going somewhere. We have to be achieving. We have to yeah. be so seeing to be successful where that's the complete opposite to what the Eastern um, philosophy of, of mindfulness seems to suggest. So how would you see mindfulness or define it within your own re- research? Yeah, it's interesting. So I, I define mindfulness differently in my research than I would in the real world because it's okay. uh, for, for me, it's the art of noticing things. It's literally, I, I break it down that simply. I know John Kabat-Zinn, it's like uh, paying attention in the moment, non-judgmentally on purpose. It's so, something to that effect. And it captures it beautifully for science. 
And but for me, it's just noticing things. It's just being aware in the moment, actually noticing things. My biggest practice is mindful self-observation. So I mindfully observe my thoughts, feelings, and bodily sensations. So I always take the observer perspective, the witness, the witnessing perspective, because I, I still get anxiety. Like I, I hope I get anxiety. If I go on safari, I'm hoping I'm gonna get anxious if an animal jumps out. Mm. So it's natural anxiety. When I do, I do a lot of public talks and I do a lot of radio work, too. I'm doing a bit of TV work as well. So I get anxious, but I have a beautiful relationship with anxiety today a wonderful relationship because the anxiety comes i watch it there's the feelings and i watch it go and that's simply that's yeah. simply all it is so it's and um, basic for me it's changing that so it's this ability to observe but i think to simplify it for me is really the art of noticing things now i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna give a couple of examples here because i think victor frankel captures the fruits of mindfulness really really well with a yeah. quote his quote is between stimulus and response, there is a space in that space yeah. is our chance to choose a response. There lies our growth and our freedom. I think mindfulness, present moment awareness, whatever that might be, really increases that space between stimulus and response. It stops you getting emotionally hijacked and it gives you that freedom. Now, I think when we to bring it back to research, when we try to research this and we're trying to measure this and we're looking at subjective measures and subscales and stuff like that, that's to be broken down a little bit differently. So I think I think a great one is, is the observation. I think the observing piece is key. And yeah. that is a really powerful one for me. There's another one, um, I, it's acting acting with, 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 with awareness. And yeah. it's close to self-observation. And there are different subscales in the five-factor mindfulness scale. And I'm getting great correlations with them, inverse correlations between alcohol misuse, wanting more. So it's like people that don't act out of awareness and don't observe seem to be more materialistic, crave more and drink more yeah. and are more impulsive. So there's interesting ones there. But it's really, I, I sometimes struggle with, the, ac the academic research against real life because i think one of the problems with academic research we need to get objective measures or we need some sort of quantitative research and sometimes i i, re I really struggle like i was a skinnerian i was all about skinner yeah. stimulus response and it says no it's bigger than that and the more i've delved into the world of spirituality and the more i do a lot of uh, corporate talks and i'm trying to bring things that work to the lay community and in the public yeah. sphere what i've noticed that, that sometimes academia and research and especially in psychology doesn't always connect and i think we're definitely, all we can definitely vouch for that <laughs> yeah yeah and, and i think like psychology is the study of the psyche and i just think fundamentally i don't think we can objectively measure some of the stuff in the psyche so maybe we just have to let that go i mm. like i was such an objective researcher in the early years skinnery and objective research if it's not quantitative it's no use all this kind of stuff but if I done my psychology degree again, I would say I'd be looking more into the phenomenological approach and stuff, which the things I rejected when I was doing my undergrad degree. Yeah. So I have a different perspective on it now. When I don't think every can everything can be uh, can be measured or sh should be measured, or I think we're trying to measure too many things in psychology that we try so hard to measure it that we're not even measuring the thing we're trying to measure, and I think that can be a problem as well. I think it's an important point because you made an important point at the beginning of, of the interview when you just mentioned growing up in a rough kind of socially deprived area. Yeah. And like a lot of us would have grown up in, in council estates and in Ireland and, and the UK and so on. And we witnessed those kinds of things. So, uh, so the, the environment you're saying, you're saying has a big in, impact on the development of, of your psyche without really realizing it. And I got that because I also read Lynn Ruan's book, who you oh, um, mentioned you? there. Lynn's a good friend um, of mine, yeah. Yeah. Um, very good yeah. and, and Lynn, I was, one thing I was missing in Lynn's book is that sense of why it, it didn't seem like her background was that bad to go yeah. into kind of a drug taking kind of like we were saying but it's uh, we, we don't take in fact that the environment has such an impact on you if that's what you're witnessing all day every day we just take that for granted yeah and there's so much just so much social problems in nearly every house along a set of terraced houses within a, a council estate we just take that for granted but if you're witnessing all, all this stuff it just has a huge impact on development of your psyche so I know that's, that's that's really interesting. So you would say to go more into exploring more qualitative research as well, just exploring what people are actually thinking per se, yeah. or is it just actually introspection? Yeah, it's it's funny. It's 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 a funny one. It's it's I'd be a bit worried where psychology is going. Like I think the replication crisis was a big one for me, and I'm like. Yeah. Right, and and then you see the barge studies where like the barge, where nothing is is getting replicated, and I'm like. 
I, I often wondered, like, if you had a sample size of 2,000 and you got some great results and then you've done another sample with another 2,000, would they actually be replicated? And I, 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 I don't think they would be. And this is just my opinion of, yeah. of, of what I've experienced in psychology. But I just think the human, like, if we've a bit, like, if you think about it, we have a billion, 100 billion neurons, is it? Like, yeah. we are so complex. And sometimes I think about, like, if we were looking at ants on the ground trying to do calculus, I would imagine if there's the gods up there, the all-knowing gods up there, they'd be saying, look at them people trying to measure the brain, measure psychology, measure yeah. the psychy, measure the mental, yeah. the spiritual life or the mental yeah. life. Like, I think we're, so, I think it's, it's, um, we have to do it. We have to try it. But I just think we're miles away from where it needs to be. And I think there's need to be objective and try to bring psychology into a, re into a real science like biology or physics and stuff like that. Because I know psychology got slagged. That's not like a real science. It's like sort yeah, of yeah. a soft science that we've bent so far in the area of trying to create these objective measures. And, and for me personally, in my studies, like I use in my master's and in my PhD study, I used a lot of uh, reaction time measures so neuropsychological objective measures with impulsivity like response inhibition uh, delay yeah. discounting all of these kind of measures and none of them correlate with impulsivity so and now there's loads of papers out saying that none of those behavioral measures correlate with it with the subjective measures as well so like yeah. there's something bigger going on and do you know what ian I, I i think then it comes down to language as well like i yeah. I, I remember being fascinated by this like we, we give a word we give it something from reality and name, we label it, and then it becomes a thing. And I remember um, thinking, all right, this, this is bizarre. Like, so reality well, well, is like, can we ever really say anything meaningful? And I know Wittgenstein does a lot of great work on this, but I remember doing the maths, the maths around this. And for humans to make up our language and describe reality can start to seem a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit arrogant to me because I, I done the maths on this. And let's say, I think uh, the big bang was 8 billion years ago. The, let's call that the start of reality. Um, it's estimated that like thinking and cognition and language, like thinking sort of originated 150,000 years ago. Language, a couple of thousand years ago, like when it really got, got a bit more detailed. So the percentage of language being around and thinking from the, the start of time is 0.00068%, something like that. So we think we can come along with A, E, I, O, U and an alphabet yeah. and a couple of consonants and create this whole arena and try to explain the nature of reality. It's like, like I said, with the gods, like it's like ants trying to explain calculus. I, I think we have to remain um, humble enough to realize that we're miles away from what it really is. And, and I know that's what science does. We do, it doesn't say it has all the answers, but I think it's important to, to, to recognize that fact, you know? No, I think it's, it's really important points. And it's something that, we are coming closer to because we are a physical organism trying to understand our physical selves like it's yeah. our own 100 billion neurons trying to understand how the 100 billion neurons Whoa. are working yeah like, there's a lot there's a line i love uh emo phillips is it uh the the, the 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 brain is a wonderful organ but then you realize who's telling you that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's great. Really is, yeah. yeah 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 no it's a brain um have you got any because uh, you, you do a lot of um, public talks and you talk to or organizations and um you've got a couple of kind of key kind of take home messages. So um, what kind of, in terms of enhancing well, well-being or just dealing with the, 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 the distress, is there any kind of take home tips that you've found that have worked um, for you generally, or do you think are just widely uh, um, applicable? It doesn't necessarily have to be someone who's ready for, th for therapy, but just kind of wants a bit of psychological tips or advice um, for life. Yeah. And do you know what? I wouldn't like, I've lots of psychological stuff. I've drawn a lot from acceptance and commitment therapy. There's some great metaphors out there. It's a great metaphor, a Buddhist metaphor around force and second darts. So I'll, I'll chat about that in a minute. But um, one thing that I found, find very beneficial and something that's a little snapshot of life, they're like life hacks. And so I don't like the word life hacks. It's like a hack for life. They're not really sustainable, but I think they can give you a really good snapshot. And you want to talk about fixing clinical problems here. We're talking about snapshots for life. But I really think just writing things down, like what gets measured gets managed. So just writing things down and journaling and having a to-do list, all of these little things are really, really powerful. But yeah. something that I find, it's, it's I got, got the idea from Stephen Colby in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he has this idea of the circle of concern versus the circle of influence. So the circle of concern is the things that we are concerned about, the political situation, social media, the stuff on social media, COVID-19, lockdown, pollution, what other people think, believe and say, other people's actions. We are concerned about those things, but we have no control over them. 
And this is what causes stress and anxiety and psychological suffering. Now, the circle of influence is the things we have control over. This is our response to the situation, what we think, what we say, what we believe, what we put on social media, our response to challenging situations. And I think a really quick thing for people is to take a snapshot and say, right, what things are out bothering you that are outside of your control? What is inside, inside of your circle of concern? Things that you have no control over that are really bothering you? And what's inside your circle of influence? And what you'll find is that the things that are really making you anxious and making you suffer are the things that you have no control over. And when you put them in a box on either side and say, wow, all the problems in my life, I have no control over. Like it's a form of insanity to be trying to, it's resisting reality. And I think it's Boyer and Katie says, that if you resist reality, you will suffer. Like you're trying to fight these things which are mind because you can't control them in in a tangible way so what i do is focus on what you can control and you will remove so much anxiety and so much stress in your life so i do that that little snapshot every now and then but that's easier said than done like yeah control what you can control and don't control what you don't control but when emotions are high and it's it can, it can get very very difficult so this idea from buddhism which is around force and second darts it's one of the biggest practices in my life i always think about it is Force darts are the darts that um, life throws at us. And if you live in love, you will experience force darts. COVID-19, lockdown, financial situation, lots of force darts going on right now. Second darts are the darts that we throw at ourselves. So it's like getting stressed, getting overreactive from these force darts. Like, let's say you're in lockdown, your partner snaps at you for no reason force dart you retaliate you go over the top you get angry say things you shouldn't say second dart second dart then you feel guilty because you got angry another second dart then you feel depressed because you got guilty because you got angry another second dart and these relentless second darts which are self-inflicted cause much of our pain so back to that line with victor frankel between stimulus and response there is a space in that mm. space is blah 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 so Stimulus is usually a forced dart. There's a space between your response. And that could be a second dart or that could be a more rational thing, like a couple of deep breaths. So I think what's really important is to try to increase the space between stimulus and response. And we talked about self-observation earlier, but any kind of mindfulness practice, present moment awareness practice, introspective practice of just chilling out and trying to relax, trying to catch them emotional hijackings. And by, by catching them in their moment in full flight and stopping those secondary reactions, you will take so much of your pain away. And the four starts are always caused by external things that are out of your control. So I think a realization between that and catching those second darts can be really, really powerful. And these things are grounded in psychology. Everything's grounded in psychology at the end of the day. But I think they're very practical and very practical for people right now. So I don't like giving too many takeaways. So those two takeaways right now, what is in your circle of concern that's bothering you and what can you control and focus, what, beware of those second darts. Thanks, Brian. It's there. That's um, they're amazing take home uh, uh, messages. I think we can all relate to those because I see the, the narratives I think are just too simple. Um, we're blaming society for absolutely everything. It's society's fault that you're unemployed. It's society's fault that you're sick and everything, which like we need to create better societies. That's that's obvious. And society is not fair. They like just simply we, we try to create for, for a society. So it's not to stop doing that kind of work. But it said like there is an onus on us as well, as you said, to create that space. And that's what mindfulness really is. Yeah. It's to be ability to pause so you don't have, so you, you know, overly emotionally reacting to everything, even though it's very normal and it's, it is healthy to have a proper emotional reaction. Certainly if someone dies or your pet passes away or something is, is like, and it was, it's very normal to have stress reactions in COVID and lockdown. It is a very tough. Yeah. It's space between the stimulus and, and response while we're also working on the environment to create a better better society for all of us yeah so, but i think the narrative is either it's about yourself or it's about the environment are just too 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 simple they they do interact but we can work with ourselves while the harder work the it takes longer to work on the environment and you just, we need groups and communities working together and lobbying governments politicians and so on to create those better better, better environments but that takes a bit of time yeah. But with ourselves, we can work on ourselves and it's just to be less emotionally reactive when we don't need to be like, we, as long as we're still connected, as you mentioned, we're connected earlier on, as long as we're still connected to those really big moments that are genuine and emotional, like losing someone or losing your, 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 your job or, and, and so on, which are really tough things to deal with.
Yeah. Well, thanks, Mark. Um, can we, Brian, you've got some interesting slides just showing them, um, just to give your readers a sense of how much that you've changed um, and how healthier you are. If you could show us um, a brain scan of before. Yeah, I after. sure will. So, um, that there, I was very lucky to be in, but I wasn't lucky to be in detox, but I was lucky to be part of a brain uh, study while I was in detox. I was asked to go in uh, as part of that. We were looking at um, um, tone, um, oh, I forget, looking at the, the, the feeling tone or something like that of people all coming off methadone. So I was very lucky to be in that scan and have a scan of my brain. So I love, I got a scan of my brain done again. It's in the Institute of Neuroscience where I'm doing the PhD in 2018. Now, anyone in academia will look at them slices and they will say right there, not compared to slices. It was different resolution. It was very hard to compare the slice, but we did use the anterior commissure. It's a part of the brain used to measure anatomical slices. So this was the best slices we could get. Yeah. I'm actually going to jump back in the scanner soon and get a slice and um, to match up to that 2013 when I've had a lot more knowledge knowledge around that now i only done this research in the last year so that's i'm looking forward to that but when we looked at them like when you looked at these um side by side it was like huge changes in my brain it was very hard to see like the, the density of the brain changed but i was very lucky to uh that rob whelan and his lab yeah do, do this research called brain pad and it's brain predicted it predicts the age of your brain so it measures the gray matter density of the brain and predicts the age of your brain. So on the scans in 2013, I, strangely enough, I was 35 when I got that scan done, but I had the chronological age of a 32-year-old, which is crazy. So heroin does not reduce the age or doesn't make you older. That's what we do now. So okay. I, actually had, I actually had a younger brain by three years. But in 2018, when I got that scan, I was 39. And I have a chronological age of a 29 year old man. So I'd actually reduced the age of my brain by six years by this predicted age. And this is, there's loads of research around this, these brain pad scores and these predict uh, dementia, cognitive decline, uh, physical health and uh, mortality rate loads of really good predictors in life so I, I i believe there's like i stop taking heroin i eat healthy i exercise huge factors i start learning and changing the density around that as well big factors around that but i genuinely believe that the shift in perspective i have and the um my ability to develop a great relationship with anxiety i don't get stressed like covid19 two years of my phd research were wiped away i barely it barely knocked me like I really did. I, I think I smiled, to be quite honest. My book mm -hmm. was launched 29th of, Mar 29th of March last year. My book was launched. I was supposed to be on the Ryan Torberty show uh, for anyone that's not from Ireland to be like the what, Ellen DeGeneres of, of Ireland, I suppose. Um, and um, I remember just, I remember when that happened. It was like the Ryan Torberty show was cancelled, book shop launches cancelled, bookshops are closing all in the space of a few hours. And I remember feeling it in my body. Oh, oh my God. Oh my God. But I remember then just catching it and saying, no, it's okay. I'm living on bonus time, which is the name of my book. I've been given yeah. a second chance at life. Everything's great. And I remember looking out the window and smiling. And I was, wasn't smiling because everything was cancelled. I was smiling at my ability to catch those emotions in full flight through self-observation. I stopped those second darts. And I believe that ability, which I've harnessed, so I'm not activating the amygdala, I'm not activating the stress response, I haven't got cortisol, like a drip, dripping into my body, being triggered by all external elements. And I believe that is one of the biggest things that's that's allowed me to change my brain and to do extra research, to, to, to have a, a consistent morning routine and to have... The, the core practices in my life that I have that have helped me to change my brain. So it's just really great to have those brain scans because there's so many disbelievers out there as well. And people think it's fluffy, mindfulness, gratitude, visualization, because you can look into the science of all these things. So it's great to be able to talk about these, have the lived experience, but then have the scientific evidence to back it up as well. And I think you've had amazing insights, Brian, and you explain things so well. Like you've got a great knack for explaining things in kind of everyday language that we can all relate to. But I think it's quite powerful to like reduce your brain age by that much from being 39 and say that you've got the brain age of 29 and they have do have good predictive ability as I said for things yeah. like um development of early onset and uh, dementia and Alzheimer's and horrible things like that uh, which a lot of us will, will, will suffer at some point but it's it shows just the effects of basic life life changes but I like what you're saying these things seem simplistic might seem like mindfulness can even seem like a party game or something like that yeah. but that early morning routine just that my, my mindfulness and that gratitude and writing down kind of a gratitude 
relationship to other people and, and the world around you. And um, so I just wanted to thank you, Brian, because you've been uh, an amazing, amazing guest. And I've learned a lot. I always do when, when, when I want to talk to you. And um, so just for the listeners again, so your book is about bonus time and it's, it's available. It's available. Yeah. So if, if anyone's interested in, in anything I do, so I blog a lot, I do a lot, I write, do a lot of blogs and um, a lot of video content on my website. So everything's on the website, the book, the courses, video content. So it's www.brianpenny.com, P-E-N, Brian. P E N N I E Brian Penny all one word, com, and uh, everything is everything is in there. Yeah, that's brilliant, Brian. Thanks. For it. And I think just to finish up because I think this quote has probably been misused a lot. I'm not sure if even F. Scott Fitzgerald actually meant it the way we all have kind of interpreted it, but I've heard it so often. Like there are no second acts in American lives, and it's been trotted out in so many TV shows and films and magazines and newspaper articles. But I definitely think in your case, it's completely wrong. Like there, there's a definitely second act in American lives or just in Irish lives. And there's a generally, I think there could be a second act in, in everyone's life. I think you're a great symbol of, of hope, um, Brian. I think you're a great role, role model now. And having the loving support of your family and everyone else who went through that, we were with you to help you to get to the place where you are, but also your own personal drive. And just what, what I get a sense from you is a great lust for life and a great passion for life and wanting to live and wanting to achieve and wanting to do a lot. Well, also, um, what you mentioned early on the interview, I think is key, is just now that you feel connected, yeah. like the effect of being connected to people, connected to the world around you, connected to yourself. And I think that's a, it's a major lesson for all of us, especially now that we're in lockdowns and we're feeling disconnected from yeah. people and we can't hug people and we're missing going to the pub or to coffee shops, chatting to people and, and visiting people's houses and so on. But I think that connectedness is good, like is, is the key to mental health. It's good mental health. It really is. And, and, and to, leave, to leave listeners with this, like when, when we're on our deathbed, we are not going to like, I love to achieve. I love getting lots done, but I'm not going to be looking for another 24 hours of hustling when I'm on my deathbed. Yeah. If I had given 24 hours or a week or a month back, I would want to spend it connected with me loved ones. And I think that's really, yeah. really important. Connection is key. Excellent. Thanks very much, Brian. I, I really enjoyed it. And um, I think a lot of people will get a lot out, out of this. And uh, just b- b- best luck. And I'm looking forward to calling you doctor. Dr. Penny soon. It doesn't, it sounds so strange when you said at the start, I'm like, oh my God, is that really going to happen? Fingers crossed. I still have a 70,000 words to get through, but I've I've five big months ahead. I like what you said though. I've already written a book. That was 80,000 words. So I'm thinking, all right, I'll be all all right. (laughs) Thanks so much, Ian. I absolutely loved it. I really enjoyed the conversation. Cheers. Thanks, Brian. Take care. Bye-bye.